Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode, we're talking with UC Santa Barbara graduate student, Sammy Davis. Sammy shares how she started her career as a marine biologist, what it's really like to work in this field, and how her research studying the impact of rapidly growing large macroalgae on coral reefs is important to the ecology of the reef ecosystem and to the people who depend on it. Sammy is conducting her studies at the Gump Research Station on the island of Moorea in French Polynesia. The Gump Station provides opportunities for visiting students to conduct research on a variety of topics, from sea urchins to corals to ocean acidification. It seems like one of the really neat things about working at the Gump Station is the camaraderie and the sharing of ideas and just talking about your research with all these other people who have a lot of knowledge and are interested in yeah. what you're doing. It's a really kind of priceless experience, I think, and I think you find that in a lot of grad programs, but it's special to come here. So we have that, you know, kind of a grad camaraderie at UC Santa Barbara, but then also to have one in your research site where you can come down and there are people working here, you know, your colleagues, your friends who are studying a lot of things on the reef and you can kind of talk to them about research and it's awesome. The Gump Research Station is located in Cooks Bay, which has a large, shallow lagoon area with a history of being able to recover from massive disturbances like tropical cyclones. The lagoon is an ideal location for researchers to study multiple aspects of coral reef ecology as they work to form a complete picture of Morea's ecosystem and provide insight into the factors that allow the reef to rebuild and recover when other reefs around the world are struggling in the face of similar ecological problems. I got interested in marine biology when I was really young and I moved from Indiana to uh, San Diego. And so Indiana, no ocean, San Diego, lots of ocean activities. And I went to a few, um, I did a few outreach programs when I was a kid, uh, uh -huh. which is one of the reasons that I love doing those now. Because, you know, going out as a kid and going on a research cruise and trawling and pulling up all the stuff from the ocean, it was just so fascinating to me. And um, it just seemed like this, you know, far off dream. And I just kind of held it, you know, throughout um, high school and just thought, you know, I really want to get back out there and, and be a marine biologist, but I didn't really know what that was. And so I went to UC Santa Barbara, which has an amazing um, marine science, but also aquatic biology program. And so I took a lot of classes and I met uh, my advisors, Russ and Sally at UCSB, and just through talking to them about what they did and kind of finding out what, what was um, interesting to them and their passions, I kind of just, I was bitten by the bug. <laughs> and I ended up coming out here as an undergraduate um, to be an assistant for a grad student. So I was doing a lot of the, you know, nitty gritty field work stuff with a grad student and I just loved it and I loved the opportunity that to be out here and to be, you know, the intellectual freedom that you have to ask the kinds of questions that you're interested in and just, you know, go figure it out. So um, just that opportunity really sealed the deal for me and really uh, led me to thinking about doing this and really pursuing it for grad school. How do you think that marine science research is different from the stereotypical idea that people might have? Of marine biologists? Yeah. Well, I guess a lot of people, you know, they might think that most people who are interested in marine biology are interested in whales um, and work at SeaWorld or do animal training or dolphin training or something like that. But um, what I was really interested to find out when I got to college and uh, started doing research was that there is just there's almost like no end to what marine biologists are involved in. There's marine biologists like me who are out here doing field work and doing a lot of stuff in the field. There are people who are involved in more lab work. There are people who make ecological models to do predictions. Um, there's marine biologists who are out there um, studying things that are happening in the open ocean. So, um, and there's way more that I didn't even talk about. So <laughs> it's just, it's just a broader field than I think you're initially led to believe. Do you spend all your days out here on a boat, gotcha. snorkeling, and looking at your study site? Mm -hmm. 
what else do you do as part of this study? A lot of times when I'm down here in Moran, so I'm here for a few months of the year um, down doing field work. And so, first of all, every day is a work day. So I'm out in the water or in the lab or doing uh, stuff on the computer or setting things up every single day of the week. So it's not just a vacation. There's no Mai Tais on the beach. Uh, <laughs> not until we're done working anyway. So that's one thing that's a common misconception among my friends and family even. Um, but also, you know, a lot, there's a lot more to uh, doing marine science and marine biology aside from just, you know, being in the water. There's a lot of stuff where you need to have some analytical skills to enter data and analyze data and to do statistics on your data. And you need to be a really good writer. So a lot of things that we do is, um, you know, in the field we set up these experiments, we collect the data, but we also need to write that stuff up. Um, and there's a lot more to writing than just, you know, sitting down and just cranking it out. So there's, you know, there's a lot more that we're involved in um, besides being in the ocean. But I think a lot of us like this is why we are <laughs> this is initially the primary reason that we like to be in the field <laughs> because I'm a grad student you know you have this whole thought that you you need to like figure everything out immediately um, but then also you're a scientist and you're a researcher so the whole point is that you're trying to find things out that you don't know and so really just like getting comfortable with you know not having all the answers um, for you know a type A person like me, that's a little. It takes a little bit to get used to that, but I think it's one of the like if when you start to get used to it and you start to realize that the awesome thing is not having the answer, so then you can go find them. I think that's that's a really cool part of being a scientist and being a researcher. I love this research because um, it's a great. The coral reef is a really interesting place to ask questions about um, resilience and how ecosystems uh, respond to disturbances and how they maintain their essential function. So um, coral reefs, I think, are really important around the world. Um, they're very beautiful environments. They're really interesting. So it's just a great opportunity to ask the kinds of questions that I'm interested in and that I think you know our society is interested in, um, but in an awesome place. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And thanks for showing me around. Yeah, no problem. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is the dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. The award-winning Fluid Earth and Living Ocean textbooks are now interactive and online. New activities, updated content, and a teacher community. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now freely available. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org. Welcome back. Researcher Sammy Davis explains how her cage experiments exclude algae-eating fish. These experiments give scientists information about the balance between fish, algae, and coral in the reef ecosystem. Let me show you what one of the cages looks like with very low herbivory. You probably can't tell that there are a lot of different species of algae, but you can at least tell that it's full of macroalgae. Well, there's different colors, for yeah, sure. Yeah, exactly. So there are different species of macroalgae in here. There are, there's turbinaria, which is what we originally started with, uh -huh. but there's tons of other stuff that's growing here. It seems like these macroalgal communities these mature communities can consist of different species, especially when it's protected from herbivory. So this one has, I believe it has no holes in the cage, or it has the very smallest holes. So very few fish can access this. So what it seems like is you have a much more diverse algal community when there aren't a lot of fish in here. It's an interesting result that we're still understanding because we originally expected, you know, that the lower herbivory would have a lot more of the algae that we put out. We didn't really know that we would get, you know, this box of all kinds of, of diverse um, algal assemblage. So that's another cool result that we're, we'll be thinking about and how herbivory can influence the diversity of the benthic community as well. Do you think that maybe it's because the herbivorous fish um, and other herbivorous organisms, they prefer certain types of algae? Like maybe the ones in here are just yummier? That is what we think. And um, a lot of, I know that a lot of the species in here, for example, Sargassum uh, pacificum, which is a common uh, type of macroalgae in a lot of areas of the Pacific, it here, a lot of the fish will eat it. 
um, whereas they they generally don't eat turbinaria, which is the one that we put out. So a lot of the places that you see this sargassum are places where the fish can't access it. Mm. And so we're thinking what some studies have already shown is that turbinaria can provide like a refuge for these really tasty types of algae. And so that could be a reason why you find them in this, you know, basically this refuge where, that we've created <laughs> where the herbivores can't get in. You find all this delicious stuff in here. It's really interesting and a lot of times on the reef you can see turbinaria with other sorts of species um, growing within the patch. Or almost like it's growing on it, it looks yeah, like sometimes. Yeah, so it has epiphytes um, that grow on it, but it also, just within its, um, like the patches, it has other species that grow in there. And we think that that might be because um, fish are reluctant, they avoid, you know, this turbinaria that they don't want to eat. Um, and so it allows this other algae to grow and kind of flourish in that area. But on the sediment tiles that you put out with the turbinaria already on it, mm -hmm. something must have eaten the turban area. Right, so what we're thinking is that, so turban area is um, seasonal. I don't know if I told you that already, but it basically the adults kind of senesce and then they pop off and they float around the reef. You might have seen some of this stuff floating around, yep. hitting you in the face, <laughs> scratching you, but this stuff floats away and when it leaves, it leaves behind a lot of uh, tiny individuals, so it leaves behind recruits. What I found in other studies that I've done is that the recruits are really the only stage that are vulnerable to herbivores, and so this could lead to a, a situation where when the adults pop off, the herbivores are able to eat the recruits and then, you know, prevent adult new adults from forming. I see. Yeah, so it seems like uh, fish do, can eat this stuff. They really don't prefer it, and so um, it takes some specific circumstances to where they'll actually eat it. I wanted to show you this picture of kind of how prevalent this species can be on the reef. This area used to have... Oh uh, my gosh, at first I thought that was coral. In some, for some reason, the coral has died. A lot of those areas have been colonized by this species. And we think that it's very likely to persist. And so a lot of my research is trying to understand what allows this algae to persist. And so, and in so doing, understanding how the reef can recover or how it can transition into um, something that looks like this instead of something that looks like a coral reef. The implications for an area that's completely overgrown like this with a turban area for the fish and corals, it, it doesn't seem like it's very good. Well, it's hard to say because, you know, that's something that we haven't exactly um, tested at this point because it's kind of a new thing here. From other areas around the world, when macroalgae kind of takes over the reef, it leads to a reduction in diversity of most organisms, including coral, but also fish, especially the fish that people look to for their livelihood. It's generally not as des desirable for, you know, tourism and things like that. Uh, so it's, it's an, in most cases, undesirable <laughs> kind of condition. Um, but in some, you know, there's always a little bit of this algae. Again, it's it's kind of that situation where um, understanding when you what happens when you have uh, maybe an overabundance of this stuff. I've also been following natural pat patches in the field to see their natural patterns of turnover. So, um, is you know trying to compare our experiment to what's going on in the field and seeing if there are differences or similarities in how fast these adults turn over. Are you? tracking these individuals. Exactly. Too. So in this video, I'm putting tags on them just like I did in the cages. And these ones uh -huh. I've been following for about a year and kind of looking at how the patch size changes, how the density changes, just to see, you know, how fast those adults turn over and how does it compare to the study where we've experimentally manipulated that. And are they turning over at the same rate as those inside your cages? Yeah, so it's pretty much um, the same. They have seasonal patterns where at some times of the year there are tons and tons of adults and other times they are senescing and so they're all kind of popping off and you really only see the like very small recruits and juveniles. The natural patches seem to be in sync with the experimental ones, which seems like we're, we've set up kind of a, oh. a system that is at least mimicking the natural one. Do you also set up video of the herbivores in the areas outside the cage? I pretty much set up the videos for specific things, like if I put out an assay. So sometimes uh, to see you know, what the ambient levels of herbivory are kind of around these areas, I'll put cameras out or on a specific assay. So I'll put out um, 
algae that I know the herbivores want to eat, so not turbinaria, but other types <laughs> like the sargassum that I mentioned. Uh -huh. um, and then I'll use video cameras to see you know, their bite rate on these different types of things. And that's a way that I estimate um, herbivory in different areas around the reef. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii's Sea Grant. Welcome back. We're talking with researcher Sammy Davis about fish and algae on the coral reef. We learn about the importance of ecological balance and how researchers like Sammy study the coral reef environment. You know, it's really funny. I'm not sure how I got into studying the macroalgae. When I first came down here, um, I was, I couldn't really put a finger on what I was interested in. And through conversations with my advisors, it kind of became clear that I was really interested in how reefs respond to disturbances. And so with my larger interest in resilience of ecosystems, so how do ecosystems respond to disturbances or perturbations, um, and how do they maintain their ecosystem function, their, their structure. Um, so my main interest in that kind of led me to using turbinaria as a way to study it on coral reefs. So uh, my larger ecological interests have to do with how you know most ecosystems are faced with diff these types of disturbances and understanding their natural systems for then their natural natural feedbacks for dealing with this um, with these types of disturbances kind of led me on this path with turbinaria. I also love I love fish, so it's a it's a great opportunity to follow fish around and watch videos and see what they're doing, which is a really cool thing to do. <laughs> One of the things that we're looking at is how um, the ca cages with different hole sizes, uh, what happens to the communities inside of those. So what happens to the algal communities. So some of them um, started with algae in them and some of them started without algae. So we wanted to know what happens to the development of the community. So that's why we've been doing surveys every quarter for the past couple years, coming down and looking at the algae that's already in there and estimating the percent cover. But another thing we've been doing is taking pictures so that we can actually quantify by the types of algae and the cover of those types of algae over time. So this is a picture of me um, actually out there doing this survey. So every, uh, this I believe is from last summer, we go out there and I actually put a tag on each of the stipes of this type of algae, the turbinaria, which is the species that we're uh, focusing on for this experiment. So we actually chipped off the turbinaria with the rock that it's attached to and glued it onto settlement tiles in the cages okay. so that we could start all the cages, no matter what the hole size, with the same um, types of a mature algal community in them. So I go around and I'm tagging each of these individuals so I can follow over time basically how long does it take for um, new individuals to develop and tagging individuals is how we can figure that out. So this is me doing that last summer and again we've been doing this for two years now so we've noticed that um, these adult, these turbinaria um, individuals are actually have a really f relatively fast turnover so they're gone in three to four months and a whole new stand is there. But it's a, it's it's really yeah. So they're all new individuals since when we started. At least two or three times since we've started this experiment, they've replenished. But the cool thing is that in some of the cages, we started out with a certain amount of turbinaria, and it's pretty much stayed, even though they're all new different. They're new individuals. That cover is still um, present. Here is like an aerial photograph of how the cages start. So we started out in this experiment with these two tiles have just been seasoned. So that means they, we place them out in the field and just kind of let you know cyanobacteria and other little things settle on it, which is kind of a way to induce other things to settle. So all, a lot of organisms on the reef rely on settlement cues, so we just have these tiles to make them less like we just got them from Home Depot. Uh -huh. uh, we put them out for a while to let them get some natural organisms on them, and then we can use them in the experiments. So these two tiles are supposed to tell us how the community can develop without this mature algae on it. And this, these two, we established with turbinaria. So we, that's when we chipped off the turbinaria from its substrate and glued it on. So then we also have some cages with all blank tiles, and those will tell us how, in the absence of any macroalgae, mm -hmm. how the community develops. It looks like 
you told me that the tile is blank, but it looks like there's something in the middle. Is that, that's just the bolt holding it down? Yes. These tiles, um, eventually we'll remove them. This summer, we're gonna be removing some of the tiles from these cages and we'll be scraping them um, and looking at the algae under the scope. So it'll be really cool because we'll be able to see um, what types of algae are there as long with you know the percent cover that's there. So um, it'll be a really cool way to see the diversity and how that might relate to the different hole sizes or how the tile started out, the initial condition. You can't really read the tags, but this is from one of the cages with really large hole sizes. So a lot of fish can get in here, which presumably means there's a high herbivory level in here. Lots of fish eating algae. And as you can see, this is one year after starting the experiment, um, there's pretty much very, there's very low cover of any type of algae on here. You pretty much just see little bits of turfing algae, maybe a couple of macroalgal species, but not too much. And so this is showing kind of the impact that a um, very high level or even an intact herbivore community can have on the algae, algal community. So this is kind of um, good news for the overall reef health um here at the site in Morea. Yeah, this seems to suggest that, at least in some places, um, an ambient level of herbivory might be enough to control and remove established macroalgae. But like I said, in the field, um, what's really interesting <laughs> about this experiment is that it's very spatially variable. Sometimes you see this as a representative of um, what the high herbivory tiles look like, and other times they'll have macroalgae on them. Oh. And so what we're trying to understand now is how herbivory might differ in space. So it might be much more spatially variable on a finer scale than we think. What do you find most difficult about it? Well, I think for all like grad school kind of studies, it's the fact that no one's actually done it yet. So a lot of times you feel like you're on the edge of the world and you're like, what do I do? How do I figure this out? <laughs> um, but that's, a, that's kind of a cool problem to have and it's like what attracted me to doing research in the first place. I do have to tell myself, remind myself of that when I'm feeling particularly like overwhelmed, but I think that's the coolest part is to, is to try to figure this stuff out. It is really scary as well. Thanks for watching Voice of the Sea. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG's training routes go back over 40 years through professional development programs, curriculum workshops, research on teaching methodology, individualized school and district training, and so much more. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, improving schools, improving education. CRDG. Turn your love of the ocean into a lifelong career. Join NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as we unlock the secrets in the deep oceans, track rapidly moving storms, model climate trends, protect and preserve our marine resources, and so much more. It's all in a day's work at NOAA. Find a career that makes a world of difference, enriching life through science, service, and stewardship. NOAA. Healthy oceans are critical to our cultural, economic, and environmental sustainability in Hawaii. The ocean serves as a source of water, food, medicine, jobs, transportation, recreation, and energy. It controls climate and weather. Kosi Island Earth aims to share this ocean awareness by partnering with local scientists and educators to engage communities and schools in active science learning for an ocean literate population. Kosi Island Earth is working to establish new avenues for connecting research scientists with educators and communities. Kosi Island Earth is enhancing the science and ocean literacy of our island residents and visitors. Kosi Island Earth is connecting scientific research, traditional knowledge, and ocean policy. Kosi Island Earth, bringing together university, government, research, and community partners to improve science education and ocean stewardship in Hawaii.